Hello, and welcome to this event on levelling up or catching up. What next for public services? I'm Graham Atkins. I'm an Associate Director at the Institute for Government. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this event, which is kindly supported by PA Consulting. Now, over the last 18 months, the pandemic has hit public services hard. Children in primary school are now on average around two months behind where they would have been expected to be in reading and three months behind in maths. In the criminal courts, the number of cases waiting to be heard is now almost twice as much as it was pre-pandemic. And of course, in the NHS, as is well known, there are now 5.6 million people waiting for care. And that's about 30% higher than it was in the equivalent month pre-pandemic. So in short, the pandemic has given public services quite a shock and it's going to take quite a long time to catch up. But at the same time, the pandemic has exposed and in many cases exacerbated some of the inequalities that were there before. The death rate from coronavirus was almost four times as high in the most deprived areas of England compared to the least. And we all know that kind of children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds have suffered the largest learning loss. So uh, to that end, the pandemic has really made the government's aim of levelling up even more urgent. Um, and to kind of discuss these questions, uh, whether public services can both level up and catch up with limited resources, I'm really delighted to be joined by an excellent panel with a wealth of experience from politics, public services and kind of all things levelling up. So first off, we have Baroness Armstrong, who's chair of the House of Lords Public Services Committee and former Minister for the Regions. Second, we have Rachel Wolfe, founding partner at Public First and former Education and Innovation Advisor to David Cameron. Thirdly, we have Georgina Cox, partner at PA Consulting and expert in culture and leadership. And fourthly, we have Saffron Cordroy, Deputy Chief Executive of NHS Providers, one of the most prominent voices uh, in our national debate over the last 18 months. So the way this event will run, following opening remarks, I will ask a few questions of the panel before putting your questions to them. Uh, and before we kick off, I just want to give kind of three brief housekeeping remarks. So please do send in your questions as early as you like. Uh, if you can say kind of um, where you're asking your question from, it always kind of helps to give a bit more context. Please don't wait for the Q&A to start. Please you know, start sending them in now to give them the best chance of being asked. Uh, secondly, we'll be live tweeting from at IFG events with using the hashtag IFG Public Services. So please do follow and tweet along. And lastly, we'll have video and sound recording on our website within 24 hours. And with that out of the way, I would like to kick straight off uh, Baroness Armstrong. Um, the pandemic has had, as we know, as we know, a huge impact on public services. Has it made levelling up public services harder? Yes, it has. Um, the uh, first report that we did showed that um, our deprived communities, as you've said, our BME communities were affected disproportionately and that disadvantaged children fared worse during the pandemic. Uh, and the ed educational attainment gap between the poorest children and their counterpart counterparts grew wider. In our recent inquiry of, on levelling up, we found that although the various levelling up funds will provide welcome additional resource for local areas, they will not compensate for the damage caused by a decade of cuts to public services which have disproportionately affected the poorest. Numerous witnesses warned that levelling up funds will need to be supplemented with additional mainstream funding for councils, for schools and the NHS to address the unprecedented pressures which have come uh, clear uh, by the, during the pandemic. So my one killer fact, if you look at the spending plans of the Treasury in the Red Book over the next few years, unless spending elsewhere is increased, public spending on public services, 44% of that will be taken by the NHS. And I say to you, that is unsustainable for the NHS and for the rest of public services, because the NHS needs other public services to work well, otherwise they will also uh, be overrun. 
So we really do have to have the government looking much more seriously at consistent longer term funding for local authorities, for other public services, in order to do the early intervention and the work to make our communities more resilient. Because what we found was communities were simply not resilient and many public services going into the pandemic were not as resilient as they needed to be in order to ensure that people got what they needed during that period. And as you've said, we've now got long back, uh, backlogs. So yes, the pandemic has made it more difficult to level up and the government needs to think about more than the NHS and more than transport and infrastructure in the way um, it is tackling levelling up. Great, thank you Baroness Armstrong. I mean Rachel that's a fairly stark set of comments and a, and a pretty difficult challenge. How could and how should public services level up? So I'm going to start with where Hillary ended, that the government should focus on uh, more than just the uh, NHS and transport and infrastructure. And I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm always struck by the number of panels and events that I go to or I'm on, which is like, what does X mean for levelling up? And X is insert anything that could possibly be ever considered that something the state gets involved in. So I want to I want to tighten slightly, at least from my perspective, before I kind of just answer your question, because to me, there are things that the state has to do really well universally, like make sure people can get a GP appointment. That always comes up really high in, in any poll about what people want from the state. But, but that's not levelling up. Um, and then there is things that matter enormously to the future of individuals and social mobility. And schools are usually absolutely at the heart of that. Is it giving people opportunity? And that that's quite a traditional conservative way of thinking about levelling up. But but it's not it's not the sort of new form of levelling up in the sense that quite often when people are really successful and do really well in schools, they leave the place they're in. So it doesn't address uh, kind of regional and, and local inequality in the way that that I think the promise of levelling up did to voters. So so what's interesting to me, um, and we can discuss this more about whether others agree, is how public services are integral to the future of places. And that's different from individual deprivation and it's different from the, the sort of universal services we expect from the state. Um, and I suppose the slightly more hopeful news or things that I would say um, following on from those very stark comments is actually I think there is a lot they can do and they don't necessarily need to come with the price tags that the NHS and transport and infrastructure have. So I'll give a few examples. Um, I think that there is vastly more that universities and other civic actors in places can do to shape the future of those places, whether that is long term in terms of, say, R&D, but also short term in terms of supporting what a place looks like, how much there is to do, how um, easy it is to people to see opportunities, how you support businesses. I think there is much more we could do on a local level, perhaps least with the NHS to allow communities to determine either directly through provision or simply through devolution, what the priorities for public services in their place should be. And I think there's vastly more we can do to just improve the fabric of places. How does it feel? Are there, to quote a Create Streets report that was kind of uh, launched yesterday, are there trees on the street? Are there things that we're doing to improve local health in small ways as well as large? So I think there is actually quite an expansive role for public services in in what I think of levelling up as, which is our places getting better to be in short term and long term that don't need to come with the NHS price tags. Um, that said, uh, even if you do all that, if people can't get a GP appointment in a few years, it won't matter because they won't vote for you. So um, you do need to do both. I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, Rachel. There's a lot of interesting tensions between some of the short term things government has to do and some of the longer term things that are difficult to do in improved places. Georgina, I mean, drawing on your experience, what do you see as the biggest challenges to catching up and levelling up? Yeah, thanks. So um, I guess fo following some of the similar trends of um, what both Hillary and Rachel have mentioned, I mean, it's not a straightforward answer, but I've tried to focus in on three dimensions around breadth, around depth and also around delivery. 
And I think yeah, similar uh, similar to what was said before, and that the single biggest challenge that we have here is really in the breadth of what we mean. So it's not novel when I say it, but defining what is meant by catching up and levelling up is a really important first step. And that matters both policy wise, but also implementation wise. And I am watching with keen interest how this is unfolding over the recent and coming days now, given the recent announcements. On one hand, it can be seen, as we said, about a catch all, a slogan that anything and everything can actually sit under. But the opportunity there becomes so diluted, it's just not possible to drive meaningful change on the ground. Yet on the other hand, it's so narrow and it's focused on, you know, Rachel mentioned, bidding rounds and infrastructure investment. But that really starts to stifle the local innovation and real sustainable impact. Catching up from COVID is real. It's addressing hospital waiting lists, children falling behind with their learning, as you mentioned, Graham. But let's also remember the inequalities that have had a spotlight shone on them and hands have been exacerbated over the past 18 months. They've been around for decades. So it's only by addressing the real breadth of those factors that drive inequality that we can begin to collectively make the choices that take us closer to the solutions. And I do agree that needs to be at different levels. I see it sort of at three levels. The first really is how we compete at a country as a country at an international scale. Secondly, is ensuring that all parts of the country are able to fulfil their potential and they can contribute to that vibrant, happy and healthy society. And thirdly, it is about addressing variation within places, and that is communities, its neighbourhoods and its streets. Which I guess takes me to the second challenge around the depth of this. And will government truly recognise and fund and support devolution around the interdependencies and ultimately deliver system reform. I think tinkering around the edges of policies and systems is not enough. Neither can a one-off fund, which was mentioned earlier, however large, be expected to deliver if that mainstream funding drives in the other direction. So it's about addressing those root causes. And um, Hilary Cotton talks a lot about the capabilities needed to live a good life. So work and learning, it's about health and vitality, communities and relationships. I absolutely love this and I think this forms the foundation of what is a cross-governmental approach. It's grown out from deep listening and understanding of our diverse, wonderful communities. And then it's also enabled and unlocked by effective and joined up policy decision making. Which I guess brings me to the third challenge around delivery and actually this is where I spend most of my time at PA with clients across local government and health and others and that's how to actually make it happen. Um, I'm going to leave a lot of the politics and policy to my other panellists who are far more knowledgeable in that debate but there is no getting away from the fact that government cannot afford to invest only in long-term solutions without those short-term tangible visible wins. So I think the risk here is that we focus on seeing a change in the short term and we forgo the opportunity that we actually have to feel the change in the longer term. So if we're truly to deliver on this agenda, we do need to be clear on the breadth. We've got to recognise and address those root causes and the depth. And we do this through collaboration and also through local systems leadership. Great, thanks Georgina. It's a very interesting set of reflections. I think one central tension at the heart of this is that both levelling up and catching up are pretty difficult things to do and they take a lot of resource. Uh, and we know that the NHS in particular is in for a difficult winter, not least also social care and many other public services. Saffron, I mean, given all of these challenges, should we even be trying to catch up and level up at the same time? It's a brilliant question. Um, I think that actually the way that I I visualise um, catching up and levelling up is that they should be the same thing because I think if we see how we deliver services through a health inequalities lens and tackling health inequalities, the two do not have to be and should not be mutually exclusive. So I think that if, if you went through a document that had levelling up in it and just did a kind of find and replace with with tackling health inequalities, you would probably come out to the place, or not just health inequalities, from my, my perspective, health inequalities, but that's kind of locked into other inequalities, but you probably come to a place where, where you reach a pretty sensible outcome. So certainly from an NHS perspective, I mean, 
the the statistic that that Hillary gave at the beginning of of her her talk around you know it, it taking 40 percent of the public sector spend you know it is a huge chunk I think that the NHS is in a place of of great need it does not want to be there and it would be in a it would rather be in a place where it saw other other bits of the public sector and the public service being adequately supported, adequately funded and more resilient to be able to be in a position to play the prevention role rather than the NHS playing the cure role. So I, I see I see catching up and levelling up actually as the same thing from an NHS perspective, because what we know hospital trusts are doing up and down the country is actually viewing their waiting lists through a health inequalities lens and saying who who isn't accessing services that need to be able to access service, who's in need that, that needs it that we haven't yet seen, as well as the people who are on the waiting lists for quite legitimate and, and priority reasons in terms of their in terms of their health. Um, I think if we look at this through a mental health perspective, I think we get it's it's a better description and illustration of maybe how we might tackle the the overall health need in future. If you look at what goes on in mental health is we see a really clear relationship between the pulling away of other services through lack of investment, particularly in local government, particularly in education whereby people who should have been identified and highlighted as needing some more support than they were getting have fallen away. We don't see them. They then come into the system later than they would have done. They are iller than they would have been. Their length of stay, the duration of their treatment or care within an NHS setting is more intensive than it needed to be and lasts for longer than it should have done. And then being able to discharge them from an inpatient setting, for example, is way more challenging than it might be because there aren't the supported housing, the step down beds, the community provision that they perhaps need. So if you look at mental health, I think solving mental health dilemmas would actually give us a really good model for solving the, the challenges that we face across the wider NHS and local government. And I think the final point I would make is if you get it right for people who are in most need, you get it right for everyone. So I think that one of the things we've seen is a kind of either or scenario and, you know, tackling the backlog is more important than levelling up or vice versa. No, if if you treat those who are in need and you put the resources behind that, then you will create a system, you know, that that works for everybody. And I think that that that's where we need to focus is these aren't these aren't mutually exclusive concepts if we're going to tackle the waiting list we we should also be tackling health inequalities from my perspective at the same time thanks Sethel. that's a really interesting reflection and i think i was particularly struck by your comments of how much of an overlap there is between uh in many ways uh leveling up and, and health inequalities so one thing that i really wanted to talk about because i think it's important is that we talked a lot about current challenges but in a sense, lots of different governments have tried to level up, either in terms of regional policy or improving uh, the outcomes of public services for, for particular disadvantaged groups. Um, perhaps I should start with Baroness Armstrong, who has obviously been in government and tried to tackle some of these before. You know, what should the current government be learning from past attempts at regional policy and past attempts at improving public services for disadvantaged groups? There are two things that my committee think they need to do without qualification, as it were. The first is to devolve more power. And the second is to therefore devolve more funding to local areas. And the two things need to go together. And I will give you two examples from the Labour government of local initiatives that worked in terms of uplifting the people involved in relationship to the people within the wider area that they lived. The first was New Deal for Communities, a right wing think tank onward in recent uh, months said that New Deal for Communities was the most effective community development initiative 
in the last 30 years. Um, and that basically gave a sum of money and powers to a local area. And they were encouraged to do things like oh, take over assets within that area and to really make that space, make that place. And Onward reckon that the outcome, the evaluation shows that on average, people within that area improved their position 18% more than people in the surrounding local authority. And if you look at spearhead authorities um, in the health, that the health service were responsible, that was a health inequalities policy, which um, narrowed the gap, particularly in things like um, life expectancy, which is a manifesto commitment of this government to reduce life, um, the difference in life expectancy. And Spearheads did that through things like the smoking cessation program uh, and other very specific things. So the examples are there of what you can do to really shift communities and the people living within them. And um, that is what the government needs to do in levelling up. And I hope that Michael Gove will go back and look at what we know works. Thanks, Baroness Armstrong. It's a really interesting point. Um, I mean, perhaps if I could turn to you, Rachel, if you were if you were in MHCLG at the minute and advising on Gove once they've uh, re redone the nameplates, would you be telling him to look at the New Deal for communities? What uh, what policies do you think this government should be considering? I mean, I I definitely agree that. Um, it's very hard to see a medium to long term uh, gain in regions without serious devolution of power. And some of that will be at the sort of combined mayoral authority level or to local authorities. Some might be directly to communities or, or indeed organisations. But it is implausible that you are going to get um, serious reductions in these kind of imbalances of various kinds without giving more power to those communities. Um, the thing, though, that I have always felt um, is that sometimes when we are focused on these huge, you know, and we should be focused on these huge challenges around differences in life expectancy, opportunities, you know, we, we spent a decade putting vast amounts of money through a pupil premium that has redu which reduced inequality a tiny bit. You know, these huge challenges, which we don't actually, let's be honest, know fully how to solve that we sometimes miss the smaller things that people are saying they, they want and are looking for that can make a tangible difference quite fast and give them confidence that we're on the right path. So the sorts of things that, that we hear a lot in our focus groups are things like, why is there graffiti on the cenotaph? Why does my place just look down at heel? You know, why are the shops all boarded up and closed? You know, the park used to be lovely. Now it's, you know, it's horrible and the events are being cancelled. You know, it's these, it's these relatively, you know, we can say trivial, but they're not trivial to these people. They matter enormously in terms of their lives and, and how much they matter. That actually you can start to make an impact on really quite fast. And my, uh, my view of levelling up has always been that if you want to get permission over a long period to deal with these massive challenges where we should be humble enough to, to admit we don't know all the answers, you have to demonstrate to people that you're able to make the small changes first. So, so I mean, that that is my advice. I will say, though, which is probably different from the rest of the panel, that I, I think if anyone or any department, given its new ministerial team, uh, is going to start making really serious differences in the, this area, it is the new I could never remember the order of the letters in the last one. I certainly can't remember it in this one. But it's the new, it's the new department which he's lead, which Michael Gove is leading. I think I think they will start to make changes soon. Great. Thanks, Rachel. I was really struck by one of the points you made there that you know to kind of do long-term transformative change, you need to you know, build uh, legitimacy and support by improving things in the short term. Obviously, lots of those levers around kind of community infrastructure and uh, civic amenities sit within local government. So Georgina, perhaps you'd like to come in on this. What do you think local government uh, needs or you know, how could it improve um, on some of those 
uh, visible, tangible changes that Rachel was mentioning. Yeah, yeah, really great points, Rachel. Um, and, and I think part of it is really about us, as I said before, about taking that system wide view of the opportunities and the challenges. And that's both at Whitehall level, but also locally. Um, it is worth saying, um, you know, let's not bash everybody. There are absolutely phenomenal examples all over the country where local authorities and their local health community voluntary sector partners and private sector partners are making a real difference. Um, we had the MJ Awards last week and some incredible stories and winners and nominees that, that went that and that just touches sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think you know, there's some, there are some commonalities between those that are really starting to, to make a difference. Um, I think you know, some of the biggest changes that I think are needed in local government is to feel confident that they can redefine their own role within the place and the system that they work. And it's taking on that leadership role as a system leader, which is really different to being a leader within a single organisation. And that's very much about culture and mindset and humbleness, which someone just mentioned earlier. And uh, I've always worked with local authorities. It's a real passion of mine. Uh, I'm uh, incredibly humbled by what I see them do every day. And I think a local authority has an absolutely unique position in every place. So how can they shift their sort of largely sort of service delivery model and underfunded model to a facilitated kind of place shaping model. Um, if you take an example, you know, of a joint working, for example, between GPs and care homes um, sitting in different parts of the system, um, it's not one organisation benefits accrue to one organisation, resources are spent by another. But actually, by being able to align those two together, there's a lot of evidence around reductions in hospital admissions, for example, by up to 40%. Um, it has a massive implication and impact on both the costs in the system, but also more importantly around the quality of life. And um, that's an absolutely key role that uh, local authorities can continue uh, continue to strengthen and learn from their neighbours and their peers as they move forward. Great, thanks Georgina. I was really struck by the comment you made about um, care homes and GPs being so essential as kind of the pressures being put on hospitals. I mean, Saffron, uh, perhaps a controversial question. In essence, the NHS has the most generous settlement of the upcoming spending review. How should it be sharing that money and kind of where should it be directing it um, to get the most out of it and to level up? So, wow, that is a challenging question. Um, I think that, um, so I think that what we've got in train at the moment is is um, a process of moving towards um, system working so um integrated care systems is the jargon but you know it's essentially um a set of local organizations including health including local government including the voluntary sector coming together to identify need and to deliver services on on the basis of that need so i think we are moving in that direction and i think that's the right direction of travel i think that in that sense, we we are already seeing actually in the best of the ICSs which are already up and running, we we see a, a kind of distribution of that investment across different places and different needs. So if you go to um if you go to Yorkshire where they've got some of the best ICSs working, you will see that voluntary sector and local government services um are are very extensively supported to deliver for the whole health and well-being of of the community because they are closest to the people and they understand those needs and they work with health services more in the background to give them the infrastructure support. So, you know, we are seeing places where where some of this is happening. I think that it, it's also fair to say that the interdependence between the NHS and other public services is huge. I mean, it's a bit of a, a cliche, but we would always say, you know, if you cut social care, then the NHS bleeds and vice versa, because we know that there is, you know, that they are so intertwined in terms of the services that they provide to each other, as well as providing to the individuals that, that they are caring for. And it is absolutely critical that that we think really carefully, not just about how the NHS is funded, but also about how local government is funded. And I think one of the most 
you know, if 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 I were if I were Michael Gove for the day, what I would say is let's reform local government funding and local government financing because we'd we'd move. I don't have the solution for that, but I know it's something that desperately needs looking at. You know, I worked in local government 20 years ago um, and it needed doing then and it wasn't done. And it 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 certainly hasn't got better, frankly. And if we're talking about levelling up, if we if we base a funding base for a particular local service on the level of revenue that it can create locally, then we're never going to level up properly because richer places get more income, poorer places get less income. And it, it's quite a simple equation. So, you know, there are there are wider, more fundamental elements that we need to look at. But going back to the question in hand, I just wanted to get that point in, frankly. Um, but going back to the question in hand, it's really, really important that we recognise that that health understands its role as an anchor institution within local communities, as a local employer, as a local procurer, as part of local systems that are working to both treat ill health, but also to prevent ill health and also to think about health and well-being. I think one of the most shocking statistics that that comes up now is that essentially you know, there is the disparity in terms of of life expectancy that we see within different regions and we see within different groups of people. So we know, you know, in the north, in parts of the northwest, life expectancy is much shorter, as, as was previously alluded to. We also know that people with different conditions. So if you have a mental health illness, then it, if you have a severe mental health illness, then your your life expectancy could be shortened by anything up to 20 years. That is massive. That is absolutely massive. And then the other thing we also know is that overall life expectancy in this country has stalled. So we aren't lengthening people's lives now. Um, and obviously, I don't want to see people's lives lengthened if there's no quality of life. But I think as an indicator, that is also quite shocking. So perhaps, you know, there's a there's a sense of of not just thinking about this levelling up, but thinking about where we're at in terms of overall performance as well after a decade where things have been incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. Thank you, Saffron. There is a lot of interesting points in there, uh, many of which I'd like to come back to, particularly local government funding, which is a interesting, um, always an interesting thing to discuss, I think. But I'd like to get into some audience questions. So I'm just going to put one question to all of you now um, before we head over to that, perhaps a controversial one which is if levelling up is the priority, what is the one public service that the government should be trying to fix ahead of the next election? Uh, Baroness Armstrong, would you like to have a go at that first? Oh, crikey, I mean, they, they've made their decision. It's the NHS. Um, uh, if you look at what Sebastian Payne from the FT is saying, he is saying that there is a planned cut to local government of 77%. Well, you know, we've already had a 60% cut in areas that I know well in the Northeast, um, and it has been devastating. And I don't think we should be doing just one service. We need to look at, first and foremost, the needs of people and of individuals. And what they're trying to do in Manchester, certainly from the people that came to give evidence to my committee, is because they now have um, funding for some health services as well as local government and other services, they are trying to build their service delivery around the needs of, of people and of individuals and pull the money together in order to make sure that they're able to do that effectively. And you can't improve a place without improving, and that's where I agree with Rachel, people have to feel confident and proud of that place. But you don't get that just by doing at the buildings. You do that by working with them so that they feel they're gonna have the opportunities in that place to really make sure their families make a difference. So I'm not gonna be drawn into the trap of saying which one service. I think the government will, will come to want to look at that again, because as we've already all agreed, the National Health Service, if it gets all of the money, will not improve in the way it wants to, 
because other things around it are not ensuring that people have got the lifestyle, the um, uh, the equipment, the resilience to be able to benefit from the services that they get through the NHS. Got it. So I think the answer to that was don't look at one service, uh, but start with people's needs. Uh, Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, look, I agree. I mean, I think I think if a national public service based policy approach was the right one, we wouldn't we wouldn't be talking about leveling up, right? We'd just be talking about the health service. Um, I think the two areas though that have not come up very much so far in the discussion that I do think are really important are crime. Uh, you know, if you don't feel safe in small ways as well as big ways, you are never going to see a place um, improve. I think it matters enormously. I think it's going to matter more and more um, over the next few years. And the other is skills. Um, you know, I talked about education earlier on, um, but I mentioned the schools and universities. Actually, if you're really interested in local places, then you need to collect skills to local labour market. And probably the single most underdeveloped and underfunded part of our public services at the moment is skills for people who aren't going to university and lifelong learning. And for me, probably the single biggest test in the CSR about whether the government is really serious is if they put turbo boosters under skills. Great. Uh, skills and criminal justice and a test for the Treasury as well. Um, same as criminal justice, I should point out. But yes, you have both. Very good. Yeah. Um, Georgina, what do you think? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's the problem that you start to talk about services. And I agree absolutely with Hillary that you, you have to start with need. And if we continue to sort of start from what I class as like the left hand side of the page, thinking about inputs and activities and services, you need to start from the right hand side. And the right hand is about the outcomes and the needs. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to, to impact change because it isn't one single service that impacts on an individual or a community or a place. It is a whole multitude, but it's also not the same combination each time. Um, so, so being able to understand it from that kind of outside in perspective instead of the inside out is really important. And I do agree that, um, you know, there is, I have optimism, cautious optimism, um, about the future for levelling up with the with the with the changes, um, and also through the integration agenda. Um, but this is difficult because through integrated care systems, you, you you're still not actually changing the underlying sort of fundamentals in terms of the the strategic nature of what each of those different parts, all these different players in the systems are working towards the incentives, the funding routes. And as, as I think Saffron mentioned earlier, you continue to try and um, do something which on the surface looks great, but because it's so underfunded in terms of the care system and the workforce in particular, which of course we haven't mentioned, um, uh, it, it's, it's very, very difficult to be able to actually address that challenge. So I guess in summary in, or in short, say you can't take a service based approach to this and the only way the government will be able to to be able to actually create a step change is by looking at needs um, and then aligning people around those needs and those outcomes in places. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point and uh, that, that's two for two, uh, demolishing the basis of my question. Uh, last but not least, Saffron, what do you think? I think I'm in vehement agreement, actually, which is and that's not to say that um, you know, obviously, from my perspective, the NHS is is critically important. But I think actually, if we're if we're talking about levelling up here, then then actually, it's not about service. It's about looking at different levels, and that's what we've all been talking about here, isn't it? It's it's what level. You know, it's a subsidiarity argument. Actually, what what level are decisions best made at? And actually, you know, I know from my days in local government, and I know from my my current role in healthcare is that. Actually, it's making, you know, if you look at a patient pathway, the decisions about care that are made closest to the patient are usually the most effective ones, <laughs> you know, the, talking to patients, understanding what they need and then delivering care on that basis. And, and the same model applies. So it's about, you know, if we are talking about 
the local public realm, shall we say, then neighbourhood level is absolutely critical. If we are talking about what are the strategic needs of a town like where I live in Basingstoke, you know, what are our strategic needs, then your local council is probably the best point of aggregation for that. If we're talking about how do we tackle local inf or how do we tackle kind of economic regeneration and infrastructure needs, then you might look at something that we don't have in the southeast, but is, is some form of of regional government, but we don't have that and we don't have a very strong regional identity. So for me, levelling up would be about what is the level that we are looking at to take those decisions. But what I would also say on a, if we're going to be um, pragmatic, which is I think where we're at now, given half the settlement, as Hilary said, has been made. So the government disaggregated this CSR and it made one set of decisions 10 days ago or whenever it was. Um, feels like a long time to me anyway, but um, it made one set of decisions then um, and disaggregated the revenue settlement for the NHS from the capital settlement for the NHS, the health and education, the public, the public health settlement and wider spending department settlements. It's all been disaggregated. So the, the ship has partially sailed, but I think we need to be pragmatic about the potential and the opportunities that we have in what's coming, what is currently up and running in terms of integrated care systems and what we can do to learn from what's going on already, improve them, start to really consolidate the bits within them, which are about place primarily and about collaboration between different organisations, including providers. So provider collaboration, which will be about how do you get an economy of scale across different providers so you provide things more efficiently, make best use of the money, but also how do you get, how do you deliver things in a way that, you know, might be out of hospital, closer to home, more convenient for people, less reliant on long taxi journeys for people who can least afford it, et cetera, et cetera. So some, some really important day-to-day -day decisions for people with long-term conditions. And I think we absolutely, we can have, we can have the the conceptual ideas and for me you know they do sit on a kind of devolutionary plane actually but then we also need to think about how can we re be really pragmatic with the settlement we've now got half of for the next three years and look at that and think about how we make it work in a way that does tackle the inequalities that exist. No, I think that's a really important point about uh, being pragmatic. Um, so I'm now going to switch over to some audience questions, and I think this nicely links to one of the most popular ones we have. Uh, so Jamie has asked, how do you think we can accurately measure levelling up to show it's actually made an impact to communities and on an individual level? Um, Rachel, I might direct that one to you in the first instance, oh. <laughs> given that you, you wrote a very good article about tests for levelling up. By the uh, way, what... um, I should uh, say I've been looking at the questions in the list and I think they're all really fantastic questions. I'm sure we won't get to all of them. Um, so I think you have to look at this in different phases, as I've said, and you have to look at kind of short term, medium and long term um, uh, tests. But I'm going to give one that I think others won't give, which is I think a decent test is to ask people. Um, you know, I think it's not a bad test to say, do you feel your place is getting better? Do you feel safe? Do you feel that there are opportunities for people? Do you feel you know what you would do if you wanted to change something in your area? I think actually asking people about local pride and whether they feel things are getting better is a very good test because one of the things that we, I think, have revealed in this conversation is that when you're talking about levelling up in terms of places, these places are different from each other. They have different identities. They have different needs. And actually, a lot of these things don't fall into the kind of perfect measures that we often use on, say, waiting times in the NHS. Um, medium to longer term, obviously, you need to start looking at things like productivity um, and opportunities and growth uh, and social mobility. But I think, again, we are always at risk of focusing so much on these massive, very long term things where we're not going to see changes for decades that, that we miss the shorter term ones. There you go. There's a, there's a go, at least. Great. That's uh, a good two sets of measures uh, to, to look at. Um, we have another question from Martin Wheatley, 
who's asked, what should the Treasury be doing in the spending review to align uh, as well as possible money with the government's intentions on levelling up, bearing in mind the current fiscal challenges? Uh, would anyone like to come in on that? Safon, you look like you have something you'd like well, to say. I'm, no, this is this is my face that says I don't know how to answer this question. But um, I think you know I think it's I think it's a really it is a really challenging question. I think I think sometimes and this the Treasury has a really particular role to play, doesn't it? So um, you know it 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 has its hands on the purse strings. So um, I think sometimes what we need certainly from a health perspective to see is is the treasury um putting slightly less tight constraints around how money is spent and i think that that's really really important so you know of, often initiatives in health or proposals or directions of travel in health don't pass the treasury test because the money isn't spent in quite the way that the treasury wants so um i think that um you know there there could be something about thinking more creatively and innovatively in in its own spending its own approaches to spending controls but one thing i would say a really really practical thing that the treasury could do in the next spending review on capital is actually to raise the capital departmental expenditure limit for health because there is money sat in health organizations that they cannot spend because the limit is there and that seems to me to be something that we could really just solve quite easily and it would help level up. Great. Uh, one very pragmatic thing and one one longer term suggestion for the Treasury too. Um, Hilary, did you want to come in on that as well? Uh, yes, we um, and from the committee have suggested and have written to the Chancellor to say that they really do need to look at some combined bids across departments, looking particularly quite honestly at early intervention and we for practical terms said that should be around family hubs the support for families for young mothers for children for adolescents uh, is very very important and um, there are other things of course but we would like to see a cross government bid from the relevant departments to actually support children and uh, families. The other thing I would do is support in a sense what Saffron is saying and that is that there needs to be more um, uh, devolution and more control of how money is spent given to localities. And if we get on the same day as the spending review as we're promised, the levelling up white paper and the devolution white paper, um, hopefully that is what they're thinking about. Great, thanks Hilary. And Georgina, what about local government and the spending review? What should the Treasury be thinking about there? Yeah, so um, I, I was going to add potentially a cheeky point, but I guess going to the uh, reflecting on um, the need to listen and to, to to understand where good practice is and to share that and to um, to be able to use it. Um, yeah, there are a number of local authorities who have already shifted their own um, budgeting and funding to more outcome based commissioning, yeah. outcome based budgeting um, and even changing the names of some of their departments to focus on community wealth building or being fairer together in certainly one of the North London boroughs. Um, so, so I think that there's some good practice already in the local sector that um, Treasury could maybe benefit from um, taking a little look at. Great. Um, and we've got quite a lot of questions coming in about local government and devolution of kind of local funding. Um, Tom Embury from the West Midlands asks, if you're going to devolve funding locally, how can you address the existing differences that mean areas that might have to level up more, might need more funding. So kind of trying to complicate with that difficult problem that some of the areas uh, that need the most support are least able to raise it themselves. Um, Saffron, that was a point that you kind of initially made earlier. Um, how would you deal with that tension if you were sat in MHCLG? I think it is a, a really 
tricky one, but I think that we have, you know, we have all sorts of ways. I mean, we had a question earlier, didn't we, on on how we might measure whether leveling up was was happening or taking place or having an impact. I think one of the things we do know is we have a lot of input measures, but we know we have, you know, we have an, an index of, of deprivation. We understand, we actually do understand from in in all from all sorts of perspectives where need lies. So I think that actually the it's about it's about how we then you know, this is trite, but you know, to govern is to choose, I think is the phrase or something like that. It's about the choices we then make about where we invest and, and how we invest. And I think that, you know, leveling up is about making a choice on that basis. And so if if we understand where need is through different various different indexes that already exist and data that already exists, then then if we're serious about the leveling up or the tackling inequalities agenda, as I would prefer to call it, then 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 we know where where to target that. And I think that 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 is important. I think that, you know, I I don't know. I don't know enough about the technicalities of how we might flex local government funding and other bits of funding in order to do that. But what I do know is that we already have that data. We can already identify those areas that need that need the investment. So I think it would be about getting everyone signed up to the agenda in order to target the funding there. So I think I've dodged your question slightly, but I genuinely don't know the answer. <laughs> That's interesting. Rachel, did you want to respond to that? and I may have misunderstood the question. I think it's a good question because it's exactly what you see in other parts of the world, but it does slightly wonder whether, de depend on whether devolution also has to require devolution of tax raising powers, because um, you can devolve power and control without necessarily requiring the money to be raised locally. There, there are trade-offs in both, and I know lots of local authorities would love more fiscal uh, uh, powers, but, but I think we're always going to be a relatively redistributive country. There are lots of areas where we're already relatively redistributive compared to other countries. I, I'd be very surprised if that changed. That's a really interesting point. Um, uh, Hillary. Yes, we need to use our indices more generally. We need to make sure that people feel they can contribute to the thinking about that. I have to say, when I was local government minister, that was always the biggest challenge of the year, was agreeing how you were going to distribute the money and the minute eye of the detail. Um, however, people at least knew what the criteria were. One of our problems is that in all of these little funds um, on levelling up, the criteria is totally opaque. So if people really need to know what is going to happen in their area, if they're going to have a say about that, they need to be part of being clear about the criteria. And, you know, I was part of introducing the initial ind index of uh, uh, local deprivation. So, of course, I like it and it is meant to be updated on a very regular basis. Uh, and I would like to see many more ordinary people involved in putting ideas into that, but that we need very clear criteria that are consistent from the public sector across the board. It's a really interesting point. I think it's uh, useful to reflect on how much we already know and how much we already collect in a lot of these uh, areas. Um, to kind of come to the flip side of that, a really good question uh, from someone who's sadly anonymous. Um, who's asked, what strategies can the state put in place to prioritise community engagement in levelling up? So helping shape needs kind of around local areas. Um, Georgina, I'm aware that was kind of one of the points that you made in your opening remarks. Do you have any reflections on kind of what's happening in local government and how the state can work with local people to make sure their voices are heard in levelling up? Yeah, and I think Rachel mentioned it earlier as well that, um, you know, maybe the unsaid thing is let's just ask. <laughs> um, so there are some fantastic um, mechanisms whereby which you know, lo local government are already doing this, um, whether, th whether that's through citizens assemblies, 
um, or, or other mechanisms. And we, we all know what grew out of the Wigan deal and really a number of other uh, local authorities since then have really taken that forward. Um, it, it's and I think it's about it's not just asking the question, it's then listening, using that to help to then act, because if all you're doing is acting either as a post box or a, a brick wall, <laughs> then it, it's not going to help. Um, so it's about our, it's about asking and listening and then responding. Um, but it's also about um, we, we all know that it's often the usual suspects that that speak up. And I think it's really important both for state and for local um, to be able to access the unusual suspects because it's obvious it's often those who who are potentially in need of the most support. Um, and it's also often those who potentially have the, the most fantastic and creative ideas. So we do need to be able to make sure there's a mechanism and state needs to have a mechanism whereby which they're able they're able to, to bring all of that together to help to inform their decisions. And going to the point that Hillary made around criteria, it's then using that and showing how that's actually helped to then inform criteria which are broad enough, yet not too narrow, to address reducing inequalities, as we said, which is not just about you know, building infrastructure or investing in skills or improving education or improving healthcare. It's all of those things that takes very careful consideration um, and listening to be able to respond effectively. I think that's a really important point about getting the unusual suspects in, which side note would be a great film title, a sequel to The Usual Suspects. Um, Safran, did you want to uh, come in on that? Yeah, it was just a uh... A, a, an, an additive point, I hope, which is I think we also need to do something to build the resilience of local community and voluntary sector organisations who have, who typically rely on local government funding and have seen that bottomed out year on year because of the cuts in, in local government resources. And I think, you know, I don't, I'm not talking necessarily about the kind of I call them blue chip charities that that are kind of the the statutory deliverers of some bits of public service. I'm talking about those really much smaller, getting to the 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 kind of unusual suspects, those smaller community groups, voluntary sector organisations that actually make up the fabric fabric of our local communities who who really haven't had that investment that they need to have, and they are the ones who can can help make manageable local need in order to tackle it so they, they are the ones who can start to really put a voice to and collectivize some of that local need in order to tackle it and that's really really important and we've seen that bottomed out and I know that you know the NHS at a local level relies quite heavily on its engagement with those organizations and if it's not there then then they notice that it falls away. Great thanks Safran we're kind of running out of time we've got a lot of good questions left so I'm just going to ask one final one to all members of the panel, which uh, again comes from Anonymous, um, who's asked, by definition, you can't level up everywhere. So how should the government prioritise? Uh, Hilary, do you want to have a go at that? Um, you prioritise according to need. And we have the criteria, we know where the needs are, we know which are the groups in society who have need um, and we have to engage with them. And the one thing I will not be forgiven for if I don't say is that we have to involve people with lived experience of services in the design and the um, uh, delivery of our services. And if we do that, then we will get to work with those, including those who don't stand up in meetings and say things, um, but we uh, we know now how to contact them. The government I know is thinking about this, which I think is very encouraging. Uh, they even have a unit, I'm told, attached to number 10, looking at working with people with lived experience. There are plenty of organisations that have got a lot of experience of that, and I hope they're getting um, with them. Great. OK, um, Saffron, what do you think? I think absolutely according to need hillary is is quite right there i think if i were if i were going to have to break it down even further i would say that i think we thinking about longer term 
I hate to say it like this, but longer term return on investment, I would also say let's look at the needs. Where are children and families most in need and, and invest there? Because I think we have seen them suffer the most during this pandemic. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Zephron. Uh, and Georgina, um, if you were in charge, what would you be prioritising? Um, I don't want to repeat, so I'm going to add because I think the thing I would also do in terms of that prioritisation would be to make sure we're creating that um, community and culture of learning and sharing. And I think by doing that, we have a, a multiplier effect by investing in some of those areas with the greatest need, but also being able to use that to, to replicate and multiply across. Brilliant. Uh, and last but not least, Rachel, uh, any any quick answers on how to prioritise? I think we we have identified the places that have felt most left behind in the last decade or so. And we've seen it politically and we've seen it in terms of their outcomes and we've seen it in terms of their trajectory. Um, I probably don't have time to give the list, but I think the one thing which this government is fairly certain about is where it's going, um, even if it has not yet articulated how it's going to improve those places. So um, I think that's one of the few areas which is not too unsure about levelling up. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, we'll, all, we'll all be on tender hooks to try and find out where that list is. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring the discussion to a close. Uh, for those looking for more reading on public services, I would of course recommend the Institute for Government's excellent performance tracker. And for those looking for more on levelling up, I should also flag an upcoming IFG report, which is going to outline some of the challenges that government needs to uh, address in its upcoming levelling up white paper, and that'll be out on Thursday. So thanks to all who've watched today. Thanks to all those who submitted questions. Sorry for those we weren't able to get round to. And thanks in particular to our four excellent speakers for a very good discussion. Goodbye. Thank you.